that God would God will speak to us today through his word let us pray Heavenly Father thank you for this privilege we have to read your word thank you for this opportunity we have dear father to study your word and we recognize dear father that the word is of divine origin we recognize father that the word is as a result of the inspiration of the holy spirit we know dear father that spiritual things are spiritually discerned so we ask father that you may transform our hearts transform our minds from carnal into spiritual and may you speak the peace, speak the power, speak the anointing of your word into our lives, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. Please, if you haven't as yet retrieved your Bible, please get your Bible. And um, I want you to open your Bible. And as we read the word of God together, Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 25 to the end to verse 32. Ephesians 4 from verse 25 to verse 32. Here's what the Bible says. Ephesians 4 from verse 25. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not grieve do not give the devil an opportunity verse 28 he who steals must steal no longer but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need verse 29 let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Verse 30 of Ephesians 4, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving each other just as god in christ also has forgiven you i want to point out something here quickly if you go back to verse 25 of ephesians chapter 4 now, I want to remind us that so far, we have been reflecting on the power of salvation. The power of salvation, which is as a result of the power of Jesus Christ. We've been reflecting upon the power of salvation, the power of transformation. And the, the main concept of this portion of Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, the main concept is this. Genuine salvation revolutionizes every aspect of the believer's life. This is the main concept here. Genuine salvation revolutionizes every aspect of the believer's life. Now, go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. It says, therefore, laying aside all falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. Paul here is given a charge. And if we read this passage at face value, we may think that Paul is speaking about truth here as a concept. But understand that the context of this passage, truth here is not a concept, but truth here is actually Jesus Christ. If you go back to verse 21, you will realize that Paul is summarizing truth within the person of Jesus Christ. Paul is exalting Jesus Christ as the epitome of truth. And so check out Ephesians 4 verse 21. He says, If indeed you have heard him, that is Christ, and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. Jesus Christ is truth. 
As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ himself, while he was on earth, he proclaimed that eternal reality in John chapter 14, verse 6, where he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so when Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, speak each one of you the truth to his neighbor, what Paul is actually saying is speak Christ. Speak Christ. What do you mean speak Christ? What Paul is saying is that as we interact with our neighbors, as we interact with each other, we should be projecting Christ. We should be revealing Christ. We should be reflecting Christ as we interact one with another. Now, if you jump down to verse 26, after he says, speak truth to one another, that is, speak Christ to one another, speak the anointing of Christ to one another, project and reveal and reflect Christ to one another, one another. After he says that, he now speaks about anger in verse 26. He says, be angry and do not sin. Because Paul understands that anger is one of the human emotions that can cause us to forfeit the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever gotten angry? Maybe you're driving on the highway and you're late for work because you got up late and you got up late because you went to bed too late. My friends, understand this. Your day always begins the night before. And so if you want to have a good day, if you want to have a good day tomorrow, that means you need to go to bed early tonight. If you want to wake up tomorrow with positive thoughts, that means you need to go to bed tonight reflecting on positive thoughts. Are we together? Your day always begins the night before. And so Paul, understanding that anger is one of the human emotions that can displace the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that if you're living in certain parts of the world, like certain places in Canada, where the sun shines for six months and it doesn't shine for six months that does that mean that you have six months to be angry my friends no my friends what paul is referring to here is that paul is saying be very careful not to transfer the dysfunction from one day to the next and the side is my friends when you go to bed with unresolved issues when you go to bed with dysfunction when you go to bed with your mind inundated with confusion, guess what happens? Your sleep is informed by dysfunction. Your sleep is informed by confusion. As you are sleeping, your subconscious mind is processing the confusion and processing the negativity. And make no mistake, the reason why you wake up the following morning feeling like you're stressed, feeling like you just ran a marathon in spite of the fact that you may have gotten eight hours of sleep is because you've gone to bed with a dysfunction. You've gone to bed with unresolved issues. You have failed to release, you have failed to surrender those issues to Almighty God. And so as a, matter, and so as a result, when you wake up in the morning, you wake up feeling stressed out, feeling frustrated. You wake up, my friends, in an unresourceful state. And so Paul is trying to guard us, shield us, protect us, preserve us from this reality. And so that's why he says in Ephesians 4, uh, verse, uh, in, in Ephesians 4 verse, verse 26, Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Then in verse 27 he says, And do not give the devil an opportunity. Understand this. Ephesians 4.26 and Ephesians 4.27 are connected, they are related. In Ephesians 4.26, Paul says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And in verse 27, he says, And, 
That means and connects these two verses. He says, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Every time you go to bed with anger, every time you go to bed with unresolved spiritual issues, every time, my friends, you transfer unresolved spiritual issues, every time you transfer dysfunction from one day to the next, you are literally giving the devil an opportunity. You are giving the devil an opportunity to boycott your future, to sabotage your success, to crush your progress. Verse, 26, he said, verse 28, he says, He who steals must steal no longer, but must, must rather labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Paul is here speaking about transformation. And so if we are abiding in Christ, if we are abiding in the anointing of Christ, we will be transformed. We will be changed. We will be edified progressively. And then he says here in verse 30, which I want to linger on for a while as I speak on the subject, grieving the Holy Spirit. In verse 30, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. My friends, so far we've been speaking about the power and the glory and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We learned in Ephesians 1 verse 13 that the Holy Spirit is the agent that applies the saving grace of Jesus Christ to our lives. The Holy Spirit not only is the agent that applies the saving grace of Christ to our lives, but the Holy Spirit is the agent of the Godhead that seals us, that fortifies us, my friends. So the Holy Spirit seals us with his anointing. And the reason why the Holy Spirit seals us with his anointing, my friends, is because once we are saved, once we are delivered from the dominion of darkness, Satan will try his utmost to repossess us, to reclaim us. Satan will try his utmost to distress us. And so as the Holy Spirit applies the saving grace of Christ to our lives, he then seals us in order to protect us and shield us from the fiery darts of the enemy. The Holy Spirit is passionate about your success. The Holy Spirit is passionate about your deliverance. The Holy Spirit is passionate about your salvation and he will pursue you continually. He will nudge at your heart continually until you give in to that impression and you submit your life to him or you grieve him. And that's what we're going to speak about. Now, as persistent as the Holy Spirit is, as persistent as the Holy Spirit is to save us, the Bible just revealed to us that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Now understand, my friends, that grieving the Holy Spirit is not a reality that happens overnight. Are we together? So if you went to bed saved last night, my friends, I am 99.99% sure that you woke up saved this morning, so don't worry. Because grieving the Holy Spirit is not a reality that takes place overnight. Grieving the Holy Spirit actually takes place in stages. There are three stages to grieving the Holy Spirit. There is, first of all, resistance. Then resistance leads to rebellion. And rebellion leads to alienation. Here is how it works. The Holy Spirit is working with every single individual. I mentioned a few presentations ago that the Holy Spirit first works on us. Then the Holy Spirit works in us once we submit to him working on us and as the holy spirit works in us as we continue to submit to what he is doing in us he now begins to work through us so he works on 
he works in and he works through. So the first stage of grieving the Holy Spirit, my friends, is the resistance stage. That is, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you through your conscience, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you through sermons, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you through spiritual songs, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you through other individuals, there is a conviction which takes place on the inside of you. And sadly enough, many individuals respond to conviction with resistance. You know why? Because conviction challenges us to change. And many individuals are afraid of change. Many individuals are terrified of change. My friends, do you know something? There are some individuals who, as one of my friends said, but a George said one time, there are some individuals who refuse to grow up. They just refuse to grow up, my friends. They are 60 years old and they're still acting like they're 15 years old. There are some individuals, they are 35 years old and they're still acting like they're 13 years old because there are some individuals who refuse to grow up. And I've come to realize that individuals who refuse to grow up don't like people who grow up. People who refuse to grow up do not like people who grow up. As a matter of fact, they criticize people who grow up. They say things like, oh, who do you think you are? Do you forget where you came from? My friends, that, that's just so unfortunate, my friends, because guess what? You are bigger than where you came from. You are greater than your past experiences, my friends. And the reason why these individuals are trying to put you on a guilt trip is because they are exactly where they used to be 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago. But the Bible says in Psalm 4, the Bible says in Proverbs 4, rather, Proverbs 4 verse 18, that the path of the righteous is like a shining light that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. If you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life, you will be continually developing. You will be continually progressing. You will be continually changing. So when people tell you, you've changed, Tell them, praise the Lord. That's the effect of the Holy Spirit. When people criticize you and say you're not who you used to be, say, I thank God I'm not who I used to be because the Holy Spirit is working on me. And as a matter of fact, he has promised me in Philippians 1 verse 6 that he who has begun a good work in me will bring it to completion. So I want to remind you, my friends, check this out. Grieving the Holy Spirit doesn't happen overnight. It takes place in stages. The first stage is the resistance stage. And I said, my friends, when the Holy Spirit brings conviction to the hearts of individuals, a lot of people resist. And I mentioned that they resist because people are afraid of change. People are afraid of being separated from the familiar. But understand this, my friends. If you are infatuated with the familiar, you will never experience true success. If you are infatuated with the familiar, you will never experience transformation. True success, true transformation, true victory comes as a result of stepping out in faith, out of the familiar into the unknown with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and using every circumstance that life throws at you as a stepping stone. And so that, that's it, my friends, the first stage of resistance stage. As the Holy Spirit works on us, we resist the Holy Spirit. This resistance will now lead to the second stage, which is the rebellion stage. Rebellion is resistance on steroids. Rebellion is resistance on steroids. That is, you have been convicted of the word of God. You have been convicted of the gospel as it is in Jesus Christ. And you have moved from resistance to rebelling. 
That means you have made a determination. You have conditioned your mind to go contrary to the word of God, to go contrary to the will of God. My friends, you know what the scary thing is? It doesn't stop at rebellion. For rebellion leads you into the third stage of grieving the Holy Spirit, which is alienation. Alienation. And alienation is that place you get to in your life where you become a foreigner to everything that's holy. You become a foreigner to everything that has anything to do with God. You become a foreigner to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You become an alien. You are no longer living within the context of God's will. You are no longer living within the context of God's power, within the context of God's grace. You have become a, an alien to the power of Jesus Christ. And understand this, my friends. There are only two planets. There are only two planets when it comes to spirituality. The kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And so if you are an alien to the kingdom of light, guess what? You are a resident in the kingdom of darkness. If you are an alien to the things of God, my friends, you are a resident to the things of the enemy. If you are an alien to the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you are a resident in the possession of Satan. Because there are only two planets, my friends. Only two planets. Now, once you grieve the Holy Spirit, you lose the desire for righteousness. I want you to listen very closely. Yes, Clyde, you become a hostage. Once you, once you grieve the Holy Spirit, you lose the desire for righteousness and you become calloused in rebellion. You no longer have a desire for spiritual things. As a matter of fact, when people begin to speak about spiritual things, you begin to get sleepy. When people begin to speak about spiritual things, my friends, you begin to get the itch. <laughs> you want to get out of there. When people begin to speak about spiritual things, you become restless because you have lost the desire. Yes, Janice, you shudder. You have lost the desire for spiritual things. You have lost the desire for righteousness and you become callous in your rebellion. But I want to end on a positive note here. Because there are some people who are wondering right now, well, have I grieved the Holy Spirit? Have I committed the unpardonable sin? By the way, the unpardonable sin is the sin of rejection of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Rejection of the grace that the Holy Spirit offers to you, the transforming grace of the Holy Spirit. So on a positive note here, my friends, if you are wondering whether you have grieved the Holy Spirit, I want to share with you one passage. And understand this, my friends. If you are wondering whether you have grieved the Holy Spirit, the reality of the matter is that you have not grieved the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is still working with you. Because if you ever grieve the Holy Spirit, you will not even care whether you have grieved the Holy Spirit or you have not grieved the Holy Spirit, because grieving the Holy Spirit pushes you into a place of spiritual indifference. You're like, whatever, you just don't care. So rest assured, my friends, if you are thinking this morning whether you have grieved the Holy Spirit, you most likely haven't grieved the Holy Spirit because the mere fact that you are thinking about this reality means that the Holy Spirit is working on your heart. I want you to turn with me quickly to one passage in Matthew 5, verse 6. And that is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus Christ says something in Matthew 5, verse 6, that I want you to consider as we close today. Matthew 5, verse 6. 
in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Listen to what Jesus Christ says. He says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. One of the signs that the Holy Spirit is working with you, is working in you, is the sign that you have a hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So you have a desire for something better. You have a dissatisfaction with your current reality and you have a passion for something better, something greater. God is saying to you in Matthew 5 verse 6 that that desire you have for a deeper spiritual anointing, that desire you have for a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, that desire you have for more spiritual power, that desire you have to live within the context of the redeeming grace of Christ and the will of God, that desire you have, my friends, is an invitation from heaven to experience the fullness of God. That desire is an invitation to experience the reality of Ephesians 3 verse 19, which says that God purposes to fill you with all of his fullness. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. My friends, I want to ask you this question in closing. How do you relate to the urges of the Holy Spirit? For every single day, make no mistake, the Holy Spirit lays urges on your heart. Every single day, the Holy Spirit prompts you. The Holy Spirit is seeking to move you. And my question is, how do you relate to the urges of the Holy Spirit? Do you, do you drown them? with sensory stimulation? Be very careful. For many times, when the Holy Spirit gives us a spiritual urge, many times Satan is standing on the wayside to cause us to drown that urge with sensory stimulation. And so the Holy Spirit may give you an urge to spend some time tonight in the Bible. The Holy Spirit may give you an urge to spend some more time in prayer and you plan for it. You have all intentions to spend time in the Word, to spend time in prayer. And across your news feed on your, on your smartphone, you see that there's a new series on Netflix that you've been waiting to see. And guess what you do? You drown the urge of the Holy Spirit to spend time in the Word, to spend time in prayer, with sensory stimulation. You stay up all night and you watch movies and you drown the urge of the Holy Spirit, my friends. And understand this, understand this. We become more of what we see and more of what we hear. Or as the Bible puts it, by beholding, we become changed. And so whatever you spend time looking at, whatever you spend time listening to, Whatever you spend time exposing yourself to, you become more of that. That's why Paul gives us a warning in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the, by the grace of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why is Paul saying this? Paul is saying this because he is seeking to save us from grieving the Holy Spirit. And in verse 2 of Romans 12, he says, And be not conformed to the world. My friends, the world exists to present us with things to lead us away from the will of God. 
That is the agenda of the world. But Paul says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So I ask the question again, how do you relate to the urges of the Holy Spirit? Do you drown them with sensory stimulation? Do you muffle them with temporal preoccupations? Every time the Holy Spirit leads you or impresses upon you to spend time reflecting on the word, to spend time in prayer, do you decide to go clean out the garage? <laughs> the garage, my friends, has been dirty for the past five years. Now all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you want to clean the garage? Because the Holy Spirit has impressed you to spend time in the Word? Do you decide, my friends, to go sweep and mop the entire house? My friends, you haven't swept and mopped the entire house in an entire week, in an entire month. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and now you get this bright idea, well, I might as well mop the house or sweep the house, my friends. Be very careful not to muffle the urges of the Holy Spirit with temporal preoccupations, my friends. I'll get this, my friends. Understand this. I am not saying don't clean your garage. I'm not saying don't clean your house, my friends. You need to do that because cleanliness is next to godliness. The Holy Spirit takes pride in dwelling in a clean place, my friends. So clean your house, but prioritize your life. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 6 verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I've come to realize when you put God first, when you prioritize God in your life, God empowers you, my friends, to take care of everything else. How do you relate to the urge of the Holy Spirit? The urge of the Holy Spirit is a gift from heaven because the urge of the Holy Spirit the purpose of the urge is to lead you into a place of deep desire desire for spiritual things desire for righteousness desire for holiness and so the urge leads you into desire and guess what the desire does the desire produces fulfillment hallelujah I hear David say in Psalm 16 verse 11 God will show you the path of life. Do you want to enter into the path of life, my friends? David says in Psalm 16 verse 11, God will show you the path of life for in his presence there is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. This morning, God is calling you. God is pulling you. God is drawing you into his presence where there is fullness of joy and where there are pleasures forevermore. My question to you, my friends, is will you allow him to draw you? Will you allow him to pull you? Will you allow him to lead you deeper into his presence without any resistance? Think of how glorious your life would be. Think of how powerful your spiritual experience would be if you just allow the Holy Spirit to draw you and to pull you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, dear God, for your word. And we thank you, dear God, for the gift of the Holy Spirit's urges. We thank you, dear God, for the Holy Spirit's passion and desire and determination to draw us and to pull us into a deeper relationship with you. We pray, dear Father, that we will never be found guilty of grieving the Holy Spirit. We will never be found guilty of resisting the urge of the Holy Spirit which leads to rebellion and which leads to spiritual alienation. But that we would capitalize 
on every urge of the Holy Spirit as an invitation to go deeper into your anointing, to go deeper into your presence, to go deeper into your power as we go throughout our day to day, dear Father. Open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our lives, our hearts, so that we will be consistently cognizant of the leading and the urging and the moving of the Holy Spirit. And may you, dear Father, transform our hearts in order for us to resist the temptations of the enemy to distract ourselves with temporal realities, to distract ourselves with sensory stimulation. And may we submit, may we surrender to the urge of your Holy Spirit. For indeed, dear Father, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Thank you, dear God, for this blessing of your word. Keep us in this blessing and may this blessing transform us so that our lives may radiate with divine power and divine purpose, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.